the last two bonds are fused. So this is actually five bonds. See that? That are fused together. So the sacral nerves that are going through those holes are named S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. Incidentally, what nerve? What nerve is going to exit the S1 sacral foramen just at the bottom of the first sacral bone? Would that be T12? Uh, sorry, would that be L5 or would that be S1? That would be so at, at the bottom of the bone. So this is at, remember at C7, all the nerve names go below now. From C1 to C7, the nerve numbers are above. From C7 down, all the nerve numbers are below. So here, this one comes out, there's your body right there, comes out below the body, and that one would be S1. This one would be S2, S3, and so on. The sacral nerves here. All right, now let's go back before we finish this. Let's go back, let's go back up to um, the thoracic area and pick up the sternum. So we, we talked about the facets for the heads and the tubercles of the ribs. Now if you follow the articulation of the ribs around to the front, you can see that the ribs are attached to the sternum, which exist in three major pieces, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. Now, the manubrium of the sternum, as you can see, has a jugular notch here where a piece of the uh, anterior jugular vein passes. So more in blood vessels, we don't do that yet. This piece right here is called the clavicular notch because that is the articulation for the clavicle. So um, this is a, a famous joint in human anatomy called the AC joint. said that wrong. The clavicle articulates with the manubrium. So this is the SC joint. The sternoclavicular joint here, where the sternum and the clavicle are articulated. Okay, so it allows for some movement, um, and it has its typical looking synovial joint, and um, I'm not going to talk much more about it. What I want you to see here is how the ribs articulate with the rest of the sternum. We say that the first seven ribs are true, and by true we mean that they have a direct costal cartilage attachment to the sternum. These first seven ribs have a piece of hyaline cartilage that is the union between the rib and the sternum. The next five ribs, eight through 12, are called the false ribs. The first three of which, eight, nine, and 10, do in fact have an attachment to the sternum, but their attachments are to the costal cartilages above them. So you can see T is fused with nine, uh, 10 is fused with nine, nine is fused with eight, and eight is fused with seven. And so eight, nine, and 10 are considered false ribs because they don't attach directly to the bone, their costal cartilages fused to the costal cartilages above them. And then the last two are ribs 11 and 12. They're false ribs because they don't attach to the sternum at all. So there's no attachment between 11 and 12 and the sternum. All right, so there's your rib attachments. It's an unusual attachment, right? You don't expect bones to be attached to bones by hyaline cartilage. This is unusual. Normally bones are attached to bones by ligaments. This is an unusual scenario. Um, remember, cartilage doesn't heal well, so procedures on the heart are normally done by cutting through the sternum, not cutting through the costal cartilages. All right, the next bone here before we start putting some muscles on this thing is the clavicle. And the clavicle has an acromial end and a sternal end. This sternal end we just talked about, the sternoclavicular joint, attaches to the jugular notch of the manubrium. And the acromial end out here um, has an attachment to the, scap uh, to the scapula. So, um, sternal and acromial end. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit more about this. This is a superior and inferior view. This is on the sternal end, and so if you look on the inferior view, the bottom of the clavicle, you will see a rough edge near the sternal extremity. We call it the costal tuberosity. All right, you just heard me talk about costal cartilages. So what do you think is going to be attached to the clavicle at the costal tuberosity? Hmm? Costal cartilage. Costal cartilage of what? What's it closest to? Which costal cartilage? Which one? The first one. Yeah. So the costal tuberosity is the clavicular attachment to the first rib. That's where it gets its name, the costal tuberosity. The conoid tubercle is out here closer to the acromial extremity. It's out lateral. And so that conoid tubercle also has important attachments. Now, this is another place in anatomy where I just blather on about how the conoid tubercle holds your arm up. This is what I normally do. But I put a picture in today to show it to you. We will talk in, in some more great detail about um, the ligaments and stuff in the shoulder. This is coming. But I wanted you to see this, this particular ligament. It's a very important one. So here's this. You can see this is labeled. This is a little picture out of another book. The conoid part of the coracoclavicular ligament. The coracoclavicular ligament. What I am telling you is this. The clavicle is hanging on to the first rib, costal tuberosity, and the clavicle is hanging on to the scapula. It is literally hanging on to the front of the scapula by way of a ligament that goes to the conoid tubercle. And so this ligament is called the coracoclavicular ligament. And as you can see, there are a couple of pieces. I don't care if you know that. There are a couple of pieces of this ligament hanging on to the clavicle. The coracoclavicular ligament is attached to the conoid tubercle. All right, why is this so important? Y'all, this double-banded ligament right here <coughs> is the ligament that suspends your upper arm from the pectoral girdle. So your whole shoulder is built out of the scapula and the humerus. The shoulder is the scapula and the humerus. But that bony complex has no bony support to the axial skeleton except by way of the clavicle. But the clavicle runs medial to lateral. So if I let my arms hang like this, yes? What is keeping my shoulder out lateral is the clavicle. If you break the clavicle in half, you can take your shoulder and just pull it right across here. That's the only thing holding your shoulder out there is this bone. The second question then is, what is keeping the scapula, right, which is holding my arm from just falling down? You follow me? The clavicle is pushing it out that way, so what's keeping it from falling down this way? There's no bone holding it up. This is the ligament that holds your whole arm up. It is attached to the co You see why it's so important? It's attached to the conoid tubercle. It is the coracoclavicular ligament. This big daddy right here in two parts suspends the pectoral girdle, holding it from falling. So, it's important, that's why I mention it. All right, so we mentioned the scapula, the coracoid process you're familiar with, but here's a shot of it right here. This is an anterior to posterior view. These pieces and parts you learned in the lab, y'all, they are begored, they're suddenly going to take on a lot of importance as we work through the muscular and ligamentous attachments. The acromion, the acromion here, 
the acromion of the scapula is attached to the acromion of the clavicle. So what does the acromioclavicular joint do? The acromion and the clavicle, I just told you, right? The acromioclavicular joint is that joint that is holding, is holding the, the shoulders lateral. It is the fusion. So the acromioclavicular joint is the, the, it is the connector for the clavicle to push the shoulders out lateral. What is the connector that holds the shoulders from falling in period? The cracoclavicular ligament. Okay, so just, I'm just picking the big ones, the big ones, chromioclavicular here to the acromion. So really important, we're also going to put muscles there. That's the point of your shoulder. The coracoid process is the piece of the scapula on the front. And you know of an important ligament that attaches there, right? The coracoclavicular ligament. I just showed it to you. It's named for its attachments. We're going to put some important muscles here too. The short head of the bicep, the cracobrachialis, pectoralis minor, they all attach to this thing. Very important. The subscapular fossa is on the front. A muscle of the rotator cuff is there. The lateral and medial borders, the lateral and medial borders, the lateral and medial borders have all kinds of important things on them that we're going to talk about. I have to use that word. The superior border, the medial superior angle, the levator scapula, we have very important things to put there. The glenoid cavity, the articulation for the head of the humerus, important. The supraspinous fossa, the spine and the infraspinous fossa, these are all going to become very important pieces of the scapula for us as we begin to construct the body and the shoulder region. All right, so this is where we finished last time. The only muscle that we really emphasized here was the trapezius. And what I told you was, here we go, right? We look at the bones, now here we go. Let's learn the muscles, all right? So I've taught you this one already. This is review, the trapezius. Now, what do I mean, young people, when I say 11 and C3 to C4 innervation? What does that mean? How can you have cranial nerve 11 and C3 and C4 fibers in this muscle? How's that possible? From class period last time, how is that possible? Does this help? I threw this one in here today because I mentioned it last time. How is it possible that trapezius gets 11? What do you know about cranial nerve 11? Well, I know cranial nerve 11 is taking motor fibers to the trapezius. I know that. And those fibers for the trapezius come from the spinal cord. Right? I told you this. Cranial nerve 11 runs down the spinal cord making connections in the cervical regions of the core from C1 all the way to C5, pulling out information from the cord itself. And then this spinal root of cranial nerve 11 passes through the foramen magnum, am I ringing, ringing bells? And it joins then the spinal root and then becomes the accessory cranial nerve passing through the jugular foramen on its way to muscles like the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid, which I mentioned to you last class period as well. All right, that's helpful, that's review. We did it last time. Just threw another picture in today. All right, if the trapezius is taken off, I see the muscles being to it. And the next group to notice are the rhomboids. There are two of them, a major and a minor. How many do you have in the cat? You got a rhomboid major, you got a rhomboid minor, and you got a rhomboidus that goes to the head, up to the occipital bone. We don't have one, but the cats have a capitis, a little slender strap that runs up to the cap, to the occipital bone. All right, the major um, is highlighted here. It attaches to the spines of two to five and to the medial board of the scapula, and the minor goes from C7, there it is, C7 to T1. Y'all, what is that thick band right there that ends at C7? That's the nuchal ligament. That's the nuchal ligament, yeah. And what would it actually be on the tips? You see it continuing down here? What is that piece of tissue continuing along the tips of the spinous processes? 
The supraspinous ligament. Yeah, exactly. All right? So there's your rhomboids. They get C4, C5 innervation. Segmental branches. This shows you, uh, this picture shows you, I'm going to work my way deeper now. This, this, uh, this picture shows you parts of the cervical plexus and parts of the brachial plexus. And it identifies for you a named nerve that is going to innervate not only the rhomboids, but the next muscle I'm going to show you, the levator scapula. All right, now y'all, every teacher has their own way to do this. So let me tell you the strategy here. It is the way I learn, it is the way I remember, and so I'm gonna teach it to you the way I think it's easier. I could just show you a table and just read them to you and make you memorize them. But instead, all of this story is going to be a narrative where I am doing that dissection. I do the traps and I think about where the nerve fibers come from. I take the traps off and now I see the rhomboids and I'm thinking about the rhomboids and their attachments. Now, where did their nerve supply come from? How did it get there? What's the name of that nerve? And so as we do the dissection from superficial to deep, I'm going to walk you through the plexus as well. You're going to learn the cervical and brachial plexus while you learn the muscle attachments. So your next lab test will come after your next lecture test. You will have learned all the nerve and muscle attachments for here. So when you go in the lab, you will be tested on it a second time. This is dual testing. Test the monitor in the lecture, test the monitor in the lab. The only difference is in the lab, the bones will be out and the cats will be out. And I'll have bones labeled and cats pinned, and you'll have to write them out. In the lecture, they'll all be multiple choice. So the dorsal scapular nerve, then, is a nerve that is responsible for taking information to the rhomboid minor major and the levator scapula. So this is where it began, right? C4 and C5 innervation to the rhomboids. C4 and C5. C4 and C5 fuse together to form C4, C5 fibers to form the dorsal scapular nerve, which goes to the rhomboids and to the levator scapula. Got that out of sequence. We'll go back. The levator scapula, see here, gets, uh, sorry, has attachments to the transverse processes of C1 to C4, and it attaches to the superior medial border. So there's the there's the rhomboid minor, there's the rhomboid major, there's the levator scapula. The innervation of these guys is dorsal scapular nerve from the upper, uh, yeah, from, from the lower part of cervical upper brachial plexus. C3, C4, C5. That's just where the innervation for these muscles come from. You should identify the levators and the rhomboids with the bottom with the link between cervical and brachial plexus. Let me tell you how my brain's going here. As I'm working my way down the spinal cord, going out to places, I'm up in the upper areas of the spinal cord, C1 to C3. I'm thinking ansa cervicalis. I'm going to neck muscles, omohyoid, sternohyoid, sternothyroid. I'm upper cervical plexus. I'm forming a network going to the neck. As I move down the cervical plexus, three to five in the cervical plexus are going to fuse together to form a major nerve to the diaphragm, the phrenic nerve. Now, in addition to fusing to go to the diaphragm, other parts of those dorsal rami fuse together from three to five to, well, they come out of segmental branches and, and part of the fusion of the cervicalis. That's not important for me. But I know information from three, four, and five are gonna to come together to form what's called the dorsal scapular nerve. Y'all, I'm right at the border of the cervical and the brachial plexus now. C5 is where the neck stuff starts to come to an end. And then C5, C6 now, this is where the stuff of the upper extremity begins. The story of all of this is gonna start. So, this is a major breaking point, a major union point for me. I always start this dorsal scapular. It's right at the border between the top two plexuses. And that nerve goes to the levator and the rhomboids, the dorsal scapular nerve. That's the way I think of it. Now, 
This is what we said, the dorsal scapula, C3, C4, C5. You can see C4, C5 joining together here, uh, but we pick up some of three as well. We're at the bottom of the cervical plexus. We're going to the rhomboids and the levators. Now, at this point, I'm going to begin to pick up nerve information from what's called the brachial plexus. This is normally listed as something that um, people call the worst nightmare of the anatomy student, the brachial plexus. I like to think that a kid leaving my classroom will have a fundamental way of describing this. This is a picture that I created here, and it's not perfect, but this picture right here will probably get you 15 points, if not more, on your next exam. So when you come to sit for exam two, you should turn your test paper over and reproduce this image. If you can reproduce this image, there are literally dozens of questions that you can answer. I could easily write a 50 question exam off of this picture. So your book has a little different image of it, and other places have different ways of presenting it. And I know there are pieces and parts that are not on here, but there are so, so much you can answer. So what I'm asking you to do, before you come to me next class period, memorize this picture. Because I'm going to use this picture during the entire class period on Monday. We're going to go stepwise through muscles in the back dissection, right? We're working on back dissection. And then I'll move to the chest and the arms. And we're going to find that this guy right here is going to answer so many questions for us. Learn it now. Learn it forever. This will help you. I promise you this will help you tremendously as we talk about uh, the rest of the upper part of the body. Okay. On Monday we're doing brachial plexus.